Four years ago, my PhD advisor calls me into his office and he says, Hey Aldi, Oculus Rift just sent me one of their first virtual reality headsets. I don't know what to do with it. Do you want it? Yeah. Well, yes, I wanted it. And being the responsible scientist that I am, obviously the first thing I used it for was to play Minecraft. And the first Oculus Rift didn't have position tracking, but you could finagle position tracking if you bought these third-party motion controllers and strapped them to your head. So I'm sitting in the lab with wires going everywhere. I boot up the special version of Minecraft VR and I put on the headset. And I'll never forget that first moment when I peeked my head around a Minecraft cube, because that was the closest thing I had ever experienced to magic. And that moment I decided to devote myself to exploring the potential of this new technology and what it could let us do. So um, Isabel somewhat summed up my background. I uh, got my dissertation in 2015, studying the cognitive neuroscience of brain training video games. Then I had my VR lab. Um, this is where I cut my teeth with this video game engine called Unity. It was the first, first game I ever made, really. This is on the Oculus Rift DK2 with a Leap Motion hand tracker. And then I had a startup making brain training video games for the Gear VR. Um, this was a great learning experience. I did the whole startup thing. I uh, got venture capital funding, was part of the VR incubator in San Francisco, had a booth at TechCrunch Disrupt San Francisco. Unfortunately, I realized a little bit too late that all the stuff I really loved doing, like game design and research and programming, I didn't get to do any of that as, as a CEO of a startup. I had to spend half my time writing emails and the other half fundraising. But luckily, around the same time, I got headhunted by IBM Research, where I spent the past year doing everything from making a proof of concept juggling trainer to uh, a study on investigating stress and, co stress and relaxation on cognition. This one didn't end up getting past the ethics review board. Um, to this project where you use your brain activity to slow down time to make targets easier to hit with a virtual reality slingshot, I've done a lot of ridiculous projects using basically every type of VR hardware imaginable. So before I go any further, I want to make sure we're all on the same page when I say virtual reality. So virtual reality relies on something called binocular disparity, which means literally the difference between what your two eyes see. So when you look at a flat image like this, you instantly know that it's flat because both eyes see the same thing. And this is not how we see the real world. In the real world, both eyes see something slightly different. You can see this yourself right now. If you hold up your hand and close your left eye, then your right eye. My left eye sees more of my fingernail. My right eye sees more of my palm. But with both eyes open, you just see one hand. That's because our brains are really good at taking these two slightly disparate images and fusing them together into a single 3D representation. This is how we've seen everything forever. And so when it's not there, when we're looking at a flat picture, your brain instantly knows that it's not real. So VR capitalizes on this by uh, putting a screen in front of your face and giving a slightly different image to each eye. Now in virtual reality, you put on a headset and the screen is the only thing you see. In augmented reality, you look through a transparent screen. So you still see the environment, we just put stuff on top of it. Now augmented reality headsets can still use binocular disparity, so objects can feel really real, just you'll never think you're somewhere else. And then there's mixed reality or merged reality, which can mean whatever you want them to. Uh, virtual reality hardware can be split up into mobile VR and dedicated high-end VR. Now, mobile VR runs off a cell phone, and so this is like Google Cardboard, where these headsets have rotation tracking but not position tracking and no motion controllers. Uh, high-end VR, you plug into a dedicated desktop computer, and you have room-scale position tracking and motion controllers. There's a saying in virtual reality hardware, that in virtual reality, that VR hardware is like sushi. You get what you pay for, and the bad stuff will make you sick. And this is true. So this is a sample, like this is what a typical Google Cardboard experience might look like. And this is great for the price, which is free, but it really doesn't compare to high-end VR. So this is not an exaggeration or concept art. This has been out for a year. This is Google Tilt Brush. Um, to me, this just feels like the sum total of every creative medium ever made, made interactive. <laughs> Uh, this seems like the most immersive, engaging medium humanity's ever come up with. And after this, it's just matrix neural plugs. And we're still a ways off from that. Like, it's this for a while. Uh, people say that this is, it's not just the next platform, it's the final platform. Um, I don't really know where there is to go from this. A uh, quick note on motion sickness. Uh, there's no reason to ever get motion sick anymore in VR. This is a solved problem. Motion sickness results from a discrepancy in motion cues between your inner ear and your eye. So if you're wearing a Google Cardboard and you're on a VR roller coaster, your eyes are going to tell you you're doing a loop-de-loop, -loop, but your inner ear says, no, you're sitting perfectly still. And that's what makes you motion sick. Versus in room scale, when you're perfectly tracked, 
there's no discrepancy if there's no motion sickness. I've given hundreds of room scale VR demos, and nobody ever gets the, the slightest bit sick. So if you get motion sick, it's the designer's fault. Okay, so presence is the whole reason virtual reality is worth doing. Uh, it's VR's secret sauce. Presence is this thing that happens where as long as you get reach the certain minimum hardware benchmark and you don't mess it up, your brain literally believes you're somewhere else. And this can sound really hand-wavy for anybody who's never tried good high-end room scale VR, unless you have, in which case you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is the uh, co-founder of YouTube does a really good job of describing it. There's bullets coming at you and a car's flipping over and my brain knew I was in front of my friends, but then my brain didn't know. My brain thought I was walking through that parking lot. So in the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, this isn't real, this isn't real, but it seems so real. And there's a robot that jumps out at you at the end. And I jumped because your brain's an idiot and VR fools it. <laughs> your brain's an idiot and VR fools it. I couldn't put it better myself. So if you were to watch this on a flat screen, you might flinch a little bit. But when you watch it in VR, you will duck out of the way. <clears throat> this is important because it relates to an idea in psychology or in human research generally called ecological validity. Now, ecological validity just means the degree to which what you study in an artificial lab setting accurately describes the real world. Now, in VR, when you do this in a virtual reality headset, you will get ecologically valid behavior. You will duck out of the way. And also, your reaction time will decrease, just like they would in real life. You also get physiological changes. Your pupils will dilate. Your galvanic skin response will change. Your heart rate will go up, just like they would in real life. And all behavior and physiology is rooted in the brain, so I'm pretty sure we're getting ecologically valid cognition as well. I can't overstate how much of a game-changing gold mine this is for human research. Until now, if you wanted to study the cognitive neuroscience of memory, it looked like this. Or this is, this is with EEG. Or if you want to do it with fMRI, it looked like this. I spent all of grad school running subjects through a machine like this, and I couldn't help thinking the whole time that you know, wheeling subjects into a tube and having them watch a computer monitor on angled mirrors while they respond on a button box had very little to do with real life. So presence, I think, largely solves that problem. <clears throat> um, this is what presence looks like when the fight or flight reflex kicks in. So consciously, she's perfectly aware that she's in her living room. But your brain's an idiot, so when a zombie shows up right behind you, you forget. <laughs> so my project relies a lot on machine learning, so I want to give just a quick primer on that. Um, I want to use the same example that someone used on me in grad school to help me finally understand it. So let's say you have a machine learning system, and you feed it a bunch of data. So all you do in machine learning is you use data to predict other data. So let's say you feed it 1,000 pictures. Some of them have cats in them. And these pictures all have a tag that says cat equals true, cat equals one. There is a cat here. And then you have a bunch of other pictures that don't have cats in them. And every one of those pictures has a tag that says no cat here. And you feed all these pictures with their tags to this machine learning system. And then you feed it a new picture that it's never seen before. And you ask it, is this a cat? Well, based on all the information you've given it, it'll be able to tell you with some degree of confidence, no, there's no cat here. Now, instead of giving it 1,000 pictures, if you gave it 10,000, that confidence level would go up a lot. More, more data equal, equals better prediction. If you went from 10,000 to 100,000, it would still go up, but not quite as much. If you went from 100,000 to a million, it would still get better, but there are diminishing returns here. Now, for every picture, if you also notice that there was, if every picture had a GPS tag as well, you could feed that data in as well. Maybe certain parts of the world have more cats or dogs, and that would improve its predictive power. Now, if you also found that every picture also had the name of the city in which it was taken, that might help you a little bit, but it doesn't tell you a lot the GPS tag didn't already tell you. So the point here is the more unique, relevant data you can feed to a machine learning system, the better prediction it'll do. Um, now, machine learning is great because it's totally objective and data-driven. Um, there's a saying in machine learning, garbage in, garbage out. So if you give it biased, inaccurate data, it'll make biased, inaccurate predictions. But as long as the data is good, this gives you a totally unbiased way of looking at understanding the world. And I think there's something really beautiful in that. So my project that I worked on uh, last summer at IBM, I had people do a room scale virtual reality memory task, where you had to remember which object was which color, and then you had to remember, OK, which one was pink. So these objects would flash. Uh, you had to remember which one was which color. Then you had to uh, match it to the floor color. <clears throat> 
So people did this task either in virtual reality or on a flat computer screen. A uh, flat computer screen was just a mouse on a monitor. So every trial has three stages. There's the encoding phase, where you see what you're supposed to remember, and you encode it into memory. Then there's the delay phase. Then there's the recall phase. We have to remember which color it was. So I had people wear a consumer-grade EEG headband called the Muse, and I looked at brain activity during this memory encoding phase. Now, the, the task was adaptive. So as you did better, you had to remember more things. So everybody stayed at a pretty um, steady performance level. And what I did was I split up brain activity for trials that you correctly remembered or trials that you got wrong. And I fed this data to a machine learning system together with the behavioral data of which target you actually picked. And I tried to get this machine learning system to predict whether or not you would get something right based purely on your brain activity when you saw it. So I had two main hypotheses. The first was that I thought performance would be better in virtual reality than in non-VR. The second was that we'd be able to predict correct, predict recall, predict whether or not you got it right, based purely on brain activity. Now, it says predict, uh, it says predict above chance, because you're predicting the outcome of a coin flip, so you're going to get half of them right anyways. Uh, this is what presence looks like when you forget the pool table's not real. Again, this is, again, this is the designer's fault. So the first hypothesis didn't actually pan out. Um, turns out performance was equivalent across the VR and non-VR groups. I think in hindsight, this is because the task wasn't particularly spatial. So I don't think it really benefits from the, the feeling of presence you get of being in a real environment. Uh, but whatever, it's science. Uh, hypothesis two, this one did actually pan out, just barely. I, I managed to barely get uh, statistical significance. So this is the uh, patterns of brain activity. This is the group average during encoding. So all you need to know here is the, the blue line is brain activity when you see something that you later correctly remember. And the red line is brain activity when you see something that you later forget. And the only important thing here is that they're different. This means that in theory, you can predict whether or not someone will remember something based on what their brain was doing when you saw it. Now, the really cool part to me is that this effect basically goes away on a flat screen. You lose the predict, uh, brain activity loses predictive power on a flat monitor. Uh, to bring it back to the example that I used earlier, this would be equivalent to training a machine learning system on pictures of curled up puppies and bagels, and then asking it, giving it this picture and asking it to tell you it's a puppy or a bagel. It'll tell you, and it'll probably do above chance, but not by much. So, so it's much easier when the two things you're trying to distinguish between are different. And we have that in VR, but we don't have that outside of VR. I'm not exactly sure why yet, but I'm really excited to find out. Uh, this, these results were published in a conference paper. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm, I'm happy to send you a copy. So I have a follow-up study planned. I've already got an ethics approval for it. I'm just waiting on some, har on some uh, brain imaging hardware, where I want to make a few important differences to the study design. First of all, I'm adding a new condition. I'm calling this a VR control condition, where you're in VR, you're wearing a headset, but in VR, you're doing it on a flat monitor. This is to try to tease apart some of the effects of just wearing a big screen in your face. I'm also increasing the number of sensors and also the quality of sensors. I'm going from consumer grade EEG to research grade um, EEG plus optical imaging. As I said, garbage in, garbage out. So the better data you get, the better prediction you'll be able to make. And also, instead of using, in the, in the pilot study, we used a big group average machine learning model, which worked fine, but everybody's brain is a unique snowflake, so I want to make uh, personalized machine learning models for everybody. And then use these models to do individual predictions for each person. So I'm going to bring everybody in, collect data, then send them home, and then construct these models, and then bring them back in. And then when they come back in, they'll do the same task again. And half of the trials uh, will flash, uh, half the trials will be normal, like they did it the first time. 25% of the trials, randomly selected, will flash the objects twice. And then 25% of the trials will be predicted by machine learning as ones we think you'll forget. Those will also flash twice. And so if I can show better performance in the 25% of trials predicted by machine learning versus the randomly selected ones, That'll validate the idea and prove the concept that we can enhance behavior and cognition with personalized machine learning models in real time, a real time analysis of biometrics. So this is, this is what I'm about right now. 
Um, I want to leave you with a few final thoughts on just virtual reality generally. So in case it needs, in case it needs saying, virtual reality is not going to be the downfall of society. There are going to be people who abuse this technology, just like people abuse every technology. Just like some people watch too much Netflix, play too much Call of Duty already. There's also going to be a lot of stuff like this. His brain doesn't know he's not underwater right now. Can you imagine how magical that must be for him? And what if he didn't have access to a real aquarium? Or what if he's in a wheelchair? Or what if his parents couldn't afford to take him? Okay, his parents probably could because they can afford a VR headset, but <laughs> well, you know what I mean. When the internet came out, people said it democratized information. Well, virtual reality democratizes experience. And sure, it's going to be the greatest video games and pornography humanity's ever produced. But that's really easy. That's low-hanging fruit. It's already so much more than that. This is a breathing visualization that pulls people out of panic attacks. Anybody who's had a panic attack before will tell you they're not the kind of thing you get to just decide to stop having. But according to anecdotal evidence, this has been life-changing for some people. So VR can be a tool for good. It can be a way to incite social change. Don't, don't you miss him? <laughs> it can be a way to foster empathy in people. And sure, it can be a way to cyber bully more effectively, but it can also be a way to bring people together and to give people new experiences they wouldn't otherwise have. According to the internet, VR can just be a guy wearing headphones wrong. It can be whatever we want it to be. So I want to leave you with a quote, with an IBM quote from Thomas Watson, who said, good design is good business. I think these are words to live by. It doesn't matter if you're doing graphic design or set design or game design or experimental design. Whatever you're doing, just do good. <laughs> OK, my quick question is, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that the ethics committee turned you down on a project. What was the project and why did they turn you down? That was a, uh, that project, we were going to either relax you or stress you out in VR. And the way we relax you out was putting you in these beautiful nature scenes. And the way we stressed you out was by using this commonly used paradigm of you just put a, a wooden board on the floor and you have someone stand on it. And the board is above a skyscraper in VR. And they thought that would be a little bit too stressful for some people. Hello. So this question is regarding the Blue Reef migration with the child in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, children don't necessarily have co the concept of rea the distinguish between reality and, and something virtual. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about, you know, about that? Cause... So uh, I'm not saying the going to an aquarium, going to the bottom of the ocean in VR is better than doing it in real life. I'm saying it's better than not doing it at all. So I think giving, giving a child the opportunity to have an experience like that versus not have it, that just seems like a no-brainer to me.